welcome to the Transforming Trauma Podcast. Transforming Trauma is presented by the NARM Training Institute. I'm your host, Emily Ruth, and I'm so glad you've joined us today. Hi, Transforming Trauma listeners. Do you want to join the international NARM community in support of trauma-informed care? If so, please consider joining us for the online NARM basics training to become a NARM-informed professional. This is the level one training in the Neuroaffective Relational Model for helping professionals work with complex trauma. This professional training is designed to support those of you working with clients or populations dealing with the effects of adverse childhood experiences and complex trauma. This training is for helping professionals in a variety of fields, such as mental health professionals, substance abuse counselors, educators, doctors, nurses, other healthcare providers, coaches, and more. In this online training, participants will learn more about the changing field of trauma, a deeper understanding of the impacts of ACEs and complex trauma, and how NARM, one of the first models specifically designed to address complex trauma, can support professionals in the growing trauma-informed field. The next online NARM Basics training is starting in September 2022 and will run one weekend a month through December 2022. 60 continuing education units will be available for most helping professionals. Register now to reserve your spot. We hope you will join us in learning how to transform trauma. For more information and to apply to the online NARM Basics training, please visit narmtraining.com forward slash online basics. Isaac Samuelson is a licensed professional counselor working in Chicago. He specializes in counseling for LGBTQIA adolescents and adults. He is currently working at Chicago Institute for Change and has also worked as a group therapist for the Second City's Improv for Anxiety group. Isaac completed a postgraduate fellowship at Live Oak and a clinical internship at Hartgrove Hospital. Before becoming a therapist, Isaac was an actor, improviser, and clown. And in this conversation, He shares how understanding human behavior was part of what drew him to the performing arts and eventually led him to the counseling field. Isaac brings with him the lessons he learned as a performer to help his clients address fear and strengthen their voice. Please enjoy my conversation with Isaac Samuelson. Hi, this is Isaac. You're about to hear me talk a bunch and say the word queer a lot. I want to mention that the word queer is not a universal term, it's a reclaimed term. Some people like me, Find great joy in the reclamation of this word, and that it was once used to harm and now gets to be a source of identity and strength. Others have been too harmed by this word to feel good reclaiming it, and others still feel that because this word was used to harm LGBTQIA plus people, there's no reason to continue to use it under any circumstance. These are all valid and important perspectives to honor. And if you're curious what language the LGBTQIA plus loved one or client in your life wants to use, just ask. Asking what language reflects their identity takes the pressure off of you to get it right and empowers them to choose the language that speaks to their experience. We are here with Isaac Samuelson. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you. And as you might know, we typically start these interviews with the question, what would you like listeners to get out of our conversation today? So what I want listeners to get out of our conversation is the joy of a queer identity and a better understanding of the joy of a queer identity. You know, often as a result of sort of post-traumatic growth and also though kind of on its own, that there is real joy to be had. Mm, I love that. Thank you for that. So if we can dive right in, I'd love to hear more about the work that you're doing in the field of complex trauma. And then if you're open to it, talking a little bit about how you integrate NARM into your work with folks on the gender identity spectrum. Yeah. So that opening question that we so often ask, the what is it that you want for yourself? That is something that is a lifelong question that queer people kind of have to answer for ourselves, that we come to our identities through this, what is it that I want for myself, not what is it that I've been told I want for myself, what is a blueprint or a structure that I can follow, but we realize, oh, this structure doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. This isn't true to who I am. And so for a lot of us, we ask ourselves often, what is it that we want for ourselves? And so just kind of starting off, that's such a valuable question. I think when we're talking about queer identities, when we're talking about queer experiences, 
because that's where it starts. Like that's where this journey begins for so many of us. And so, you know, working with the complex trauma though of navigating a world that wasn't built with you in mind is the challenge that I like to face with my clients and collaborate with my clients on. Mm, I love that. And so I'm curious how you would define complex trauma in this context. Right, that navigating the world that wasn't built with you in mind, there's so much trauma in that because we're told that this is just how it is for everyone. You know, what is normal? What is regular? What is abnormal? There's been so much stigma historically around queer identities. And to feel something so firmly in your own lived experience, and then to have people say, no, that's wrong or bad, to say, well, it sure doesn't feel wrong or bad. And of course, the people saying it's wrong or bad are people who have no context for what you might be feeling. That is the work that I do. Yeah. So complex trauma, it makes so much sense. Yeah. That that's how folks are relating to it when it's like they're being told this is your experience and they're thinking, no, this actually is not my experience. Yes. And so kind of learning how to kind of ungaslight ourselves to say, hey, this is actually my experience. This is actually who I am. That is I think a really important aspect of the healing involved when you've been just navigating this world where everybody said, you know, who you are and what your interests are and who you love is not just not normal, but in a lot of cases, people are saying it's bad or wrong. Mm -hmm. I love that. Ungaslight ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So can you talk a little bit about what led you to working with complex trauma? I mean, I have a suspicion, I guess, but I'd love to hear more about it. <laughs> well, I mean, this kind of ties into this idea of the joy of a queer identity for me, because pretty much everything that's good in my life comes directly from my identity as a queer person, including my work with complex trauma and including my work as a therapist, including the depth and closeness of my relationship with my family of origin, including my partner, including the community that I belong to, including the friends that I have, all of it is a direct result of this. And so that I would say, exploring and navigating my own sense of self and my own sense of who I am is partially what, what led me to working with complex trauma. Yeah. Your own sense of self. I really appreciate that. So, I mean, you've been a clinician for a little while and I'm wondering what brought you to NARM. Well, I was really drawn to relational models, the mm -hmm. idea of the relationship being the agent of change, the idea that we kind of replicate our early blueprint of what a relationship looks like, you know, typically from a you know, parent or caregiver, kind of replicate that throughout our lives to say, okay, well, this is what a relationship is. And so, you know, you're going around replicating that with friends and loved ones and therapists. So mm -hmm. I love working with the understanding that anything that comes up for me or any anxiety or frustration or any feeling that comes up for me is going to be of great value for the work that we do. And so that was what really drew me to relational perspectives and helped me to also navigate the shame associated with like having feelings during session. Mm. And that's yeah. totally normal. But there's this shame like, no, I have to like unconditional positive regard yeah. looks a very certain way and has to look this way. Mm -hmm. But actually the relational models help me to use the feelings that come up as information and continue to regard clients positively. And so relational stuff and somatic experiencing. I was learning some somatic mm. experiencing uh, when I was interning at Live Oak. And I was like, man, I would love to combine some of these things in a way. And then somebody was like, oh, have you heard of this neuroeffective relational model where it's relational therapy and somatic experiencing and attachment theory? I was like, oh, the thing that I would create if I could. <laughs> Someone's already done it. Oh, good, because there's no way I yeah. do not have the discipline to sit down <laughs> and write a whole therapeutic model. I'm so glad that somebody else did this. Mm. So it was the moment I heard about it. I said, oh, this is actually all of my interests wrapped into one. Combined together. And then I decided to do the training because I wanted to deepen my relationship with therapeutic orientation. I wanted to kind of couch myself in something 
So I did that. And it's really been an awesome journey this last year. Mm. And I just realized I didn't even ask you, where in the world are you? (laughs) Chicago. Yeah, you hail from Chicago. And so you said you had a previous career. Mm -hmm. I wondered how that related to what you're doing now, because I have a feeling there might be something there. Yes, I facilitated improv for anxiety through Second City before the pandemic hit. I was performer, an actor, a clown, improviser, a musician, just kind of looking to perform as much as I could. And actually, in acting, there is something interesting that happened there. The grind of being an actor was so overwhelming for me. And so it was just not why I was in the field and realizing more and more that I was attracted to empathizing with all of the characters that I played. So finding ways in which I could understand where even the most cruel or terrible people, understanding where they come from, not condoning what they're doing or anything, but at least having some level of understanding or context for why this person is the way they are. And then when I was like, oh, that's why I like acting. (laughs) Gave me a little roadmap on what perhaps my career could be. Yeah. Oh, I so appreciate what you're saying here. You know, when you're in the character, it like creates space to have this empathy. And I can almost see like, gosh, if I can feel empathy for this person who's had this experience, maybe I can have some empathy for myself and my own experience. Like, Oh, yeah. (laughs) And that is actually where the clowning comes in. So I created a clown character named Tobes, who I basically took every part of myself that I was very critical of, Mm -hmm. all the uncool things that I felt were a part of who I was, some clumsiness. I really wanted to do things right and fell Mm -hmm. flat on my face so often. The embarrassment piece, the distractibility piece, as we discovered earlier, the sort of meandering nature of the way I can talk sometimes. Mm, I love that. Right, this sort of spaciness. I took all of that and I put it into this clown character and just made him super charming. Oh, I love that. And so you just have to love him. And so suddenly I was able to shift my own thinking about those parts of myself that I was Mm -hmm. not as thrilled about at that time Mm -hmm. and to say, no, actually, this is part of who you are and it can be charming. Yeah. It sounds like you're able to like embrace all the different aspects of yourself. And it sounds like there's like breadcrumbs maybe that led you to this field that you're in now. Oh, definitely. I've always had an interest in psychology Mm. since I was 14. I think I've been a little armchair therapist diagnosing everyone in my own mind. And of course, now I like... (laughs) I'm not so focused on diagnosis. <laughs> not funny. Interestingly, I think it's an incredibly helpful tool for a lot of people in a lot of circumstances and it can also serve to stigmatize. So I think yeah. that diagnosis can be nuanced, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'd love to hear a little bit more if you're open to sharing. Give us a little more of a picture of how you're using Narman with your clients. I keep thinking on this gender identity spectrum and the work that you're doing. And I'm curious more about that, if you can share. Yeah. The piece that I was saying about we are all in the same society. Mm -hmm. We all receive the same kind of indoctrination from the world around us, for lack of a better word. You know, we're kind of steeped in the values of whatever culture we belong to. And so queer people are also steeped in this, you know, transphobia and homophobia that exists in particularly American society. And you got to do something with it. There's something to be done with these messages and these feelings. And so often we, we turn it inwards because we see ourselves as the problem because there's no shortage of people pointing to us to say we're the problem. And so, you know, what do we do with those feelings? And that is some of the complex trauma that comes up because not only do we have to get past the external voices, we have to get past the internal voices. And for a lot of people, getting past the internal voices is a hurdle enough, but to be constantly also Mm -hmm. working against external voices, that is where I like to focus, is how do we see our own value and strength? And how do we see ourselves as powerful? And how do we see ourselves as beautiful? And that's where I get 
so much of the joy of the queer identity because there's also this really pervasive myth around queer suffering that we had to suffer for our identities. Like, I didn't. Mm -hmm. It's only brought me joy. I am so privileged and so lucky to be in a family who embraced me. And yeah, there was some moments when I first began conversations about my identity, there was some jarred reactions, but ultimately these conversations led to this incredible depth Mm. that I have with the relationships in my family of origin. It's remarkable. And I like my family a lot. So maybe we would have gotten there anyways, but I know that Mm. these conversations really facilitated that. So I want to combat this notion that there has to be suffering for a queer identity, because that's also something that happens Mm. within the queer community itself, within LGBTQI plus folks, there is a gatekeeping that can be kind of a reaction to the stigma and the prejudice against queer people. And it's totally out of safety, right? It's, hey, I'm not just letting anybody in here. I've been hurt once or twice. So if I perceive that you are someone who looks or feels like people who have hurt me in the past, like I'm going to have a pretty strong reaction to that. So it makes perfect sense. I have all the empathy in the world for people who immediately gatekeep and and garner other people with suspicion. And it can be a myth that we're telling ourselves that have you suffered enough for this? Have you suffered enough for this identity? Mm. And interestingly, people actually have a hard time with queer identities because they'll say, I don't know if I am queer enough. Like, am I enough to be in this community. And again, that question also comes out of this deep caring for the people who have suffered so much for their identity. Mm. Because there are people who have suffered intensely for their identity and have come out stronger in some cases and full of defenses in a lot of other cases. And so that is a, a challenge that a lot, like a lot of queer people face is the do I belong here? Am I queer enough? Gosh, because you mentioned these defenses. And again, we talk about this in NERM, but these defenses that at the time were so necessary, like we had to adapt, we had to create these defenses to create safety. You know, there's a lot of folks that have had to do that. And maybe I'm trying to understand a little bit more what the experience is when some of those defenses may still be necessary. They're still kind of like in the thick of it, right? Especially if they're out there in the world and they're trying to do the work. Oh, I'm so curious how you work with that. Like, how do you create space? You know, are there times that it's more safe to bring down these defenses and times that it's not? I'm so curious and I'd love to hear you talk about that. Absolutely. And it always comes back to this question of what is it that you want for yourself? Because that's how I can meet people wherever they are. Mm -hmm. I work with some adolescents and, you know, there's just kind of limited options for adolescents sometimes who don't have legal rights as an adult. That's just a real world factor. Something I like to talk about is I kind of envision this cliff. There's this plateau and you're walking along. And when you're going along the plateau, that is all of the real stuff that's going on, the actual real live limitations, the horrific, horrible bills that are being passed right now to attack trans children. These are limiting factors. These are real world limiting factors that have nothing to do with any defenses that you're putting up yourself, the oppression, all of these things, you know, that's the real world factors. And then there's a point where that drops off. And then there's a point where you take it on yourself Mm. and you start to internalize it yourself. And so what I'm looking for with clients is like, where is that point? What is that intersecting point where the real world struggles that are not about your thinking, that no amount of changing your perspective, no amount of mindfulness, all of these things really valuable. And they're not going to change these real, very real things that are happening in your life. But then where do you take over? How do we find that? And so asking what you want for yourself and what is getting in the way of what you want for yourself, is it these very real blocks? Or is there something internal happening where you are assuming that you're going to be rejected, or you're assuming that you're going to Mm. fail, or you're assuming that fill in the blank. And that's where we can do work. Cool. And what I'm really hearing is that's like the agency pillar, right? Like where? Yes, it is. where, (laughs) Where does agency come in here? Yes, exactly right. There's something about just the where are you taking over that I think can be a helpful image Because also there's this kind of wellness industrial complex piece of 
positive vibes only, you know, only mm. focus on the good and just change your thinking and everything is going to be fine. And that I think can be really dangerous when there's these sure. very real pieces. And I think that's something that Narm does such a good job with because that's so shame based. The you should be grateful is right. <laughs> ironically so shame based <laughs> as opposed to looking at rid yourself of shame as you also examine some of the things that you are doing to protect yourself that may be working against you. Yeah. I'm so glad you named that. And I feel like I've heard it talked about like when gratitude grows out of like organically your experience and it's not like you're trying to put it on yourself like I should be grateful for this, that when it grows out of it organically, yes, that's beautiful. And I've also heard that about forgiveness, like when boundaries have been crashed and when forgiveness grows out of the work that we're doing organically, that's a different thing than like telling ourselves I should forgive this person or I should be grateful or whatever. So I'm glad you named that. And I was just thinking about this the other day, actually, the whole positive vibes only thing. Yeah. I'm thinking about all the people in my life that I just look up to that are leading the kinds of life that I want to lead. They sit with those who are suffering and they don't sit and tell them you should get over this. You should be grateful or whatever. They are able to just sit with and be with, which again is that relational part of the model, right? To just sit and be able to relate. And that feels like our work, right? That we don't need to just have positive vibes only in our offices. We can sit and be with and relate. And there's so much information in negative vibes. I mean, there's so much information in held in these, what we would call negative feelings or bad feelings. Right. Sometimes the information is a boundary has been crossed. Mm -hmm. I think anger is, oh my gosh, so valuable because it's this little boundary detector saying, hey, somebody is saying something that is wrong. Now, it might be that you're wrong and you're feeling kind of defensive about it. Mm. And it might be that somebody has really crossed a boundary. And the only way that you can know that is to know your feelings back and forth. Know what information is your feeling trying to tell you. I like to say that control of emotions is not pushing them down because if you're pushing down your emotions as a reaction to them, then you're completely controlled by your emotions. Like mm. you're beholden to pushing them down every time they come up. That is absolutely 100% controlled by your emotions. People who do the opposite of what their fear is telling you, you're completely controlled by fear because you're just doing the opposite. Uh, that's still being completely yeah. controlled by fear. Right. But if you can use your feelings as information and say, okay, well, what is this fear trying to tell me that oh, there's something to be afraid of? Well, then maybe I should take some precaution. Mm. Or is this fear telling me that I don't know what's going to happen and so I should just stand perfectly still to protect myself? Well, then maybe you can push yourself into some discomfort and face that fear. And if you're angry, let me tell you that you're wronged or that yeah. you're trying to control somebody. And maybe if you're <laughs> trying to control somebody, you kind of take stock of what it is that you're trying to get for yourself in that moment. Yeah. And I'm really hearing you just get curious. I mean, it sounds like maybe what you support your clients in doing and getting curious about what's coming up and what that means, what the emotions are communicating. Yes. Curiosity is so important because we make so many assumptions. I think mm. a big assumption I mentioned earlier is this sort of tragic backstory of every queer person, that every queer person must have a fractured relationship with their family, that every queer person must have had some sort of horrible event that happened, just like I remember believing it when I was younger, that something must have happened to you, and therefore that is why. But bad things happen to a lot of people often, and not everybody comes out of these experiences with a queer identity. And so that's just such a dangerous assumption to be making, especially about clients, that, oh, you must have a tragic backstory, let me hear what it is but maybe they don't. And so curiosity is really where we begin and end with anyone yeah. and particularly queer clients. And there's no need to understand what a queer person's experience is. You do not need to understand one iota of what it is to be a queer person to believe and accept the person. You just have to kind of suspend your own perspective for a moment to just believe what the person is telling you. And that's so hard, but that's, I think, what curiosity can really afford you is to say, all right, I don't understand this, probably never will, but I'm just going to believe you 
and believe the stories you're telling me and believe the experiences that you're telling me. Oh, I really appreciate that you named that because I'm like, it's hitting a little different today. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's so true. I don't have to fully understand. And I think so often it's like, I want to understand. I want to like yeah. wrap my head around it. And the reality is a lot of times I'm not going to understand, but I don't have to. Yeah. You can approximate it by just believing people <laughs> when they tell you what their experiences are. <laughs> it works pretty well, you know, maybe not in a way that you can champion for that person, they're still the person who is going to right. understand their own experience best. So you don't want to sort of take the microphone from them, so to speak, to say, no, I do understand. But the suspension of your own perspective to just believe people can help with that understanding piece. I think people just get really stuck on, you know, wanting to understand, wanting to empathize, but just having yeah. a difficult time understanding or empathizing. One tool, though, that I think is really fun to ask cis people is how do you know that you're a man or a woman without identifying any body parts, focusing exclusively on your self-knowledge? What is it that tells you that you're a man or tells you that you're a woman? Because I'm speaking to cis people, of mm -hmm. course, I'm not including non-binary people because we have asked ourselves this. How do I know that I'm a man or a woman? What is it in my experience with myself? And it's hard to answer that because people go so quickly to you know, just naming body parts or just kind of that's what I was told I was. And that that can be one step in saying, oh, so this is how I investigate that within. This is how I challenge my own understanding of myself mm. so that I can even have a closer relationship to maybe starting to understand where you know these people are coming from. I so appreciate that. And I'm just taking that in. It's a great question. My brain likes to have a solid answer and think that I know. And so when someone asks me a question like that, and it kind of pushes me into this place of, okay, I got to get curious here. What is it? And when my brain can't tell me something for sure, that's uncomfortable. <laughs> Very. And then you start going to other things like, well, yeah. you know, I'm a guy because I like cars and stuff. And it's like, mm, well, women don't like cars. <laughs> so I was unaware mm -hmm. that we go to these sort of stereotypes that we have set for ourselves, like sports, right? There's no women's sports leagues, I guess. You know, yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. Yeah. That's great. So I was wondering if you would be able to share with us any, you know, it could be your own personal experience or any clients who might have given permission, I guess, any stories of struggle or anything that's inspired you as you're doing this work? Yeah, I'll go with my story because that's the one I have the most permission to share. Great. Yes. You know, I had this just sort of understanding of myself that there was something different. And I, in high school, I was largely attracted to women. Then all of a sudden I had an attraction to a man and was like, oh, okay, that's what this feeling is. Mm. I'm bisexual. Okay. All right, good. I'm so glad I figured that out. Now I don't have to do any more work. That's great. And then as life kind of went on, I was like, but that feels very incomplete. This is feeling very, yeah, there's something else here. And then kind of learning the distinction of gender and sexuality was so important. And sure, like gender and sexuality influence each other. They're not totally separate entities that have absolutely no influence on each other, but they influence each other like anything influences anything. It's they're different things that have an impact on each other. And the simplest way to, I think, explain gender versus sexuality is sexuality is who you go to bed with and gender is who you go to bed as. Hmm. You know, hearing that and understanding that I was like, Oh, because when I came out in high school, I was like, oh, good. I get to wear tight shirts and paint my nails and, you know, be pretty sometimes. And <laughs> that's what I was so excited about when I came out. <laughs> there was maybe a little less about my sexuality and much more about my gender. Mm -hmm. And it's, of course, more <laughs> a little longer of a story than that. I'm realizing that I told it in this very simple, straightforward, flowery way. But actually, there was a lot of pain yeah. in this. There was a lot of oh my gosh, if I don't know who I am within myself, what is going on with me? Like, how am I walking through this life having no idea who I am? Like, that's messed up. Mm. And I felt like I went through like three or four different puberties and 
that's rough. <laughs> Going through the first time was, was hard enough. <laughs> you, know, you have to go three more. Oh my gosh. Just to kind of get to a place of like, oh, yeah. the interesting part for me is I just kind of am like, yeah, I'm just me. I am not terribly concerned about labels or identity for myself because that's going to change. That's fluid that, you know, every day I have a different relationship to myself if it's sunny or if it's rainy, Mm. you know, and I think everyone does, right? That we wake up with a different relationship to our day, with a different relationship to who we are in that day. Maybe you Mm. didn't drink coffee first thing and so you have a small migraine and that's going to change the way you relate to yourself. You know, I think the same can be sort of true of gender and sexuality, that it isn't so fixed. We change our relationship to that all the time. And I have just gotten to a point now after three puberties that I am just like, okay, I don't want to go through this again. (laughs) I'm just going to accept that I relate to myself differently sometimes. And I'm just going to have to sit with that and be really excited about it. Actually, it offers an awful lot of freedom. There's an awful lot of freedom in not having to identify exactly where you might fall somewhere. Oh, I so appreciate you naming that. And I'm thinking about how, you know, in my own NARM sessions, when I'm in the client chair, one of the words that I often say, you know, when my therapist asks, what is it you want for yourself? I say freedom a lot of the time. Yeah. And so this piece that you're sharing, like creating space for however we're going to relate to ourselves, that there's freedom in that. And, you know, this piece of like, you know, who do we take ourselves to be? And as we start to unlearn some of what we realize isn't how we really experience ourselves, yeah. I'm just hearing you say that you're creating space for a lot of different ways of showing up in the day and how you relate to yourself. Yeah. And that's what it is. It's creating the space that is such a challenge because mm-hmm. we really love to organize things. We really love to categorize ourselves. We really like a firm sense of understanding of where we fit in the world. Mm -hmm. And all of that is sort of narrowing, narrowing, narrowing. How do I narrow this down as much as possible? Where I see where are my opportunities to expand? Where can I expand myself to today? Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, my brain is like clicking in a different way right now. I feel like we're going to get off this interview and I'm going to be thinking about it for a few days now. I just really am appreciating what you're sharing here. I really appreciate that. Yeah. What you've learned in your process specifically around this complex trauma piece. And I know you said, you know, you have a great relationship with your family and in a lot of ways. But then I also heard this piece of like there was some pain there. So I'm curious how that's helped you if there's anything that you'd like others to know around that process for yourself. Yeah. So I think This actually is a really good segue into a statistic that I really wanted to get. Okay, great. So I'm so happy (laughs) you asked this. And it's a hopeful one. It's that one supportive adult in a queer child's life cuts their rate of suicide attempts in half. One supportive adult, one single. That's all it takes to counter some of the programming that we've gotten. And I just know that to be true so fully that when you know that you have this support, when you know you have this person in your corner, it makes the hard parts easier. Mm -hmm. And that was never a question in my family. That was always clear. I always had people in my corner. And even with the struggle, even with the parts we're talking about, about how hard it is to understand an experience you don't have yourself. You know, we talk a lot about circles that I belong to about the impact being the important thing and the intention being very secondary, which is true. And in support, sometimes the intent can really matter and show, particularly with this one supportive adult piece. Mm. And so that was just always clear. There was always this understanding that I was supported and loved. So I think that is something that can be part of the process and also to really take some weight off of your shoulder if you're just trying to do and say the right things. The effort to do and say the right things can come from a couple of different places. I think one main place that it comes from is a desire to be there for somebody, to be supportive. Another one is to make sure that you don't look bad. Mm -hmm. And so kind of asking yourself, am I avoiding embarrassment Mm -hmm. by trying to say the right things? Or am I trying to support this person by saying all the right things? And I think that once you can 
sit with the embarrassment and be okay with it, that suddenly the conversation can start to happen and people can feel more safe sharing with you around that. Because if the intent is to support, if the motivation behind what you're doing is to support the person, it comes through in a way that when you're just trying to say the right thing to avoid personal embarrassment, it's so hard to talk to somebody who's choosing every word carefully and terrified of embarrassment. That doesn't make me feel very mm -hmm. safe in that conversation because then I feel bad if they do say something wrong and I do have to correct them, then suddenly I am causing them this pain that they have worked so hard to avoid. Mm. And that's where a lot of times people will come in and be like, oh, I'm so, 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 oh gosh, oh, I don't even, I don't know why I said that. I'm so, so sorry. Oh my gosh. You know, when we have that reaction, the people who are on the receiving end of that apology suddenly feel a pressure to say, no, it's fine, even when it's not. And so how do we just say, oh my gosh, I made a mistake. I apologize. Move on to show the person that we're there for them, not to protect our own selves from perceived to someone who is prejudiced, you know, mm -hmm. that taking the focus off of ourselves in those moments to be a support for people, I think can be really helpful. Yeah, I really appreciate you just sharing more about this because I imagine I'm not the only listener who's taking this in. And if you're an adult in the support role, it's a lot to think about, a lot to consider. And I just really appreciate you sharing that. And that statistic, it's like heartbreaking and really hopeful at the same time. Yeah. And the heartbreaking part is that the opposite is also true. Right. That when a child feels abandoned with no support, that that can really add to a person's suffering, that can really add to a person's struggle. And kind of asking yourself, like, who do I want to be in these people's lives? Do I want to be that supportive adult or do I want to add to the suffering? Mm, this has been such a great conversation. Thank you so much, Isaac. And I just wonder if there's anything else that you feel needs to be said that feels kind of left over that you'd like our listeners to hear. Yes. And also a positive thing, because uh, yeah. unfortunately, the one thing I do want to say is thinking about some of these bills that are set to pass where offering gender affirmation care to adolescents is, you know, being looked at as felony child abuse and that science tells us that the opposite is true at conversion camps and not embracing your child is actually what causes more harm and that people kind of saying if i had to make a permanent decision about myself when i was four you know i would have made a terrible choice you know i was playing with whatever you know when i was four i didn't know what i was talking about but you knew you were a boy or you knew you were a girl when you were four or five, playing with those dolls, not knowing how the world worked. You knew who you were in relation to the world. And so these kids, so do these children. They know who they are in relation to the world. And the more we can support those kids, the better. And so just really wanting to also raise some awareness about some of these really horrific bills that are being put out there and presented in some of these states around the rights of trans people to access health care is really distressing. And in fact, most gender affirming care is done for cis people. You know, most people who are prescribed hormones, for instance, are cis people, um, whether it's going through menopause or aging or other mm -hmm. kinds of medical necessities for this gender affirming care. That's the bulk of it. So that's sort of just yeah. general information that I wanted to be sure was clear and was mm -hmm. out there. But I do want to end on something much more positive. Mm. And just the way I see my own queer identity and the queer identities with the people that I come in contact with, there's no unifying story. There's no unifying experience. You know, everybody has their own unique perspective. Everybody has their own unique story. And it's just so cool because I think one of the main benefits of a queer identity is this outside of the norm thinking. We are the culture creators. We are the mm -hmm. people who push things forward. You know, thinking of art and music, like and fashion, and all this stuff that brings us joy so often stems from queer communities. You know, I won't take entire credit for all the things that are great in life. <laughs> a lot of it. But, but a lot of it. <laughs> right. So, so that's the note I want to end on is that I really want people to see the inherent value of queer identities, not just because you overcome something traumatic, not just because you're strong and resilient, like, yeah, and creative and thoughtful and 
Yeah, so I just want to leave y'all with the joy of a queer identity. What a joyful way to end. <laughs> Thank you so much. Of course. And Anna, if you could share with us, how can people find you, especially if they're in the Chicago area? Yeah, so I work at the Chicago Institute for Change. That's where I work. Great. You can see me on the website there. That's where I can be found. And yeah. I'm in the Chicago area. Maybe you'll see me clowning around as Tobes someday too. I love it. And we'll put some links to your website and other things in the show notes so folks can get in contact. This has been so great. Such a fun conversation. Thank you so much, Isaac. It's been a pleasure. Of course. Thanks so much, Emily. Thanks so much for joining us for today's episode. To find more about our guest and their work, check the show notes or visit us at narmtraining.com slash transforming trauma. Hey, transforming trauma listeners. Please join us starting in September for our online NARM basics training to learn how to transform trauma. This training is available for helping professionals working with clients or populations dealing with complex trauma. Now more than ever before, it is essential that we learn how to resolve complex trauma and support post-traumatic growth. If you are looking for more advanced training in understanding the impacts of attachment, relational, developmental, and intergenerational trauma, and are working in healthcare, education, substance abuse recovery, or allied fields, join us for this level one NARM training to become a NARM informed professional. For more information and to apply, please visit narmtraining.com forward slash online basics. Thanks to Andrea Klunder and the Creative Imposter Studios for producing and editing, to Tori Essex for our album art, and to Brad Kammer for the creation of this podcast. We look forward to building community, connection with you, and changing the world by transforming trauma. Mm-hmm.